If James Michael Curley was the people's mayor of Boston past, then Scully Square was the people's soul. It was every man's place. And you didn't get treated slight for going in. Scully Square was the closest thing to a four-letter word that you could have had. You'd see GIs come down Washington Street. Hey, bud, where's Scott? Uh, just, just go out there, take a left, and you're in it. And of course, that was it. At night, it was mad. There was a hustle and bustle around the square, and uh, people would uh, would uh, go up to Joe and Nemo's, uh, who was on the on the corner of a small street, and uh, they'd uh, they'd get the most delicious hot dogs there that you could ever want to get. And for uh, for ten cents, you could get a, get a hot dog and a a glass of soda. It was a uh, a pleasure watching the man deliver the hot dog to you. First, he'd take the bun uh, out of a container, a steamed container. He'd take the bun out. Then he'd, he'd uh, open it up. Then he'd put in, he'd, he did this so quickly that you could hardly, hardly keep up with him. But he'd put a spoon uh, into the onions, chopped onions, and he'd put them in first. Then he'd, get, uh, then he'd get another spoon with relish and put it on top of that. He'd put the hot dog on. Then with a paintbrush dipped in mustard, he'd paint a strip of mustard across the top. Scully Square got its name from Colonel William Scully, a real estate mogul of the 1790s. Over the years, the square was home to Yankees and to immigrants, to actors and inventors. Thomas Edison made his first patented invention here. It was the automatic vote counter. Today, some reminders of yesteryear still haunt Scully Square. The steaming tea kettle that was first hung in 1875 and the mosaic tiles of Scully Square under, the first subway in Boston. And as for old Charlie, well, who knows? He may still be riding on the MTA. He may ride forever in the streets of Boston. He's the man who never returned. He's the man who never returned. He's the man who never returned. But it was burly, it was burlesque that brought the sailors flocking to Scully Square. A triumphant homecoming for the Coast Guard cutters, Taurus and Bramble, as they steam into Boston Harbor after circumnavigating the North. This is where I used to stop all the time to get my jobs, right here. Then I go down that way. Who's going to go now? Let me you let pick him up go. your fares here, then? Yeah, I'm a, well, from here to Army Base. Rosie LaCurras remembers Scully Square well. She drove a cab in Boston for 50 years. This is the area of Scully Square, and over there on the left is where the old tattoo places used to be here, and Sally Rand and all of them. That's Sally Rand, as in fan dancing. And then, of course, there was the other Sally, Sally Keith, as in tassels. I saw her, I saw her once or twice, and she had these tassels. Yeah, and they were Ooh, going to his remarkable. Opposite yeah. direction. Opposite view. <laughs> and how she could talented. stop on the statin <laughs> was something nobody could find out. Yeah. Not a seat was empty when Sally and her tassels played the Crawford House, one of Scully Square's three burlesque theaters. And if you timed it right, you could catch the queen of Scully Square, Ann Corio, just up the street at the old Howard. Well, the one I remember the most is Ann Corio. <laughs> I can't think of the names of the other ones. We used to tell her to take it off, but she wouldn't. <laughs> the straight man would sing a pretty girl is like a melody, and she'd just walk around. And slowly, without even knowing it, the clothes would come off. My line was, uh, I can't take that off. I'll catch cold, you know. I'll catch cold. <laughs> Ralph Sayer was a film projectionist at the old Howard. She always had something new and something exciting. And, uh, of course, a burlesque audience. 
uh, doesn't care uh, about the quality of the dance very much. They weren't interested in that. They were only interested in the final result. And when the final result went too far, then the Watch and Ward Society, the self-appointed keepers of the public morality, would send in the city censors. The doorman uh, who was hired, uh, especially because he knew all the uh, censors in town, uh, would have a little button uh, by the door that he would press uh, when, whenever a censor came into the theater. And uh, immediately, uh, a little red light would flash on and off in the center of the footlights, and a buzzer would sound backstage. Everybody backstage was hollering, Sunday school, Sunday school. He would hit that button, the light would go on, and from doing an act, if a girl was doing a strip, it would become Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. The building that became the Old Howard originally was a church built in the 1840s. But the congregation's minister, warning that Judgment Day was near, soon lost his flock when his prediction failed. Sixty years later, many who entered the Old Howard thought that they had died and had gone to heaven. All you would see was shiny heads in the, inside the theater there, the, the ball heads, they were all there. So too were the women and not just as strippers, but as spectators. But it was not until the 40s that the old Howard finally put in ladies' rooms. Yes, you can never go in there alone. You always have three or four with you. Yeah, we were never good. The men would be in the house before, and we'd be in the best seats in the house in the balcony, and they were looking up. <laughs> they have the curtain here, all right? And then they put their leg on it. And they go up and down and up and down and oh my god, and the guys are goo and gar and ooh and all that, and all the bald heads are shiny. <laughs> I never went there. <laughs> if you ever spoke to the men, they never went for the strippers. They went for the comics. You could only get in if you looked old enough, so... Those years you were you wore reversible coats. You had a raincoat one side and tweed. You put up the collar, you hide your school books underneath. You could only do this in the late fall and the winter go. One ticker, please. <laughs> You'd see just about everyone. Uh, there was no special class that went there. You'd see the affluent, you'd see the poor, and you'd see all in between. Even Mrs. Harriet Ropes Cabot of Beacon Hill paid the two dollars for a seat. Well, I didn't think it was very exciting, frankly. <laughs> well, I mean, it was uh, nice, healthy-looking girls <laughs> kicking their heels up. I don't remember seeing anybody there that we knew. I can't remember. But as I say, I was alone with five men. <laughs> Something like five that. geologists, actually who were visiting Mrs. Cabot's husband. It was no coincidence that the old Howard was nicknamed the Old Harvard. Many a crimson student, and even some professors it was rumored, crossed the Charles for burly distractions. And a certain undergraduate became one of the regulars. Harvard boys. And you know who was one of the biggest in the days of Anne's old Howard days? JFK, who was at Harvard at the time. Yes. Now, we can tell this, he's been gone for a while, bless his soul, but he was in love with one of the strippers by the unlikely name of Peaches Strange. <laughs> <laughs> All the Harvard boys, including JFK, who was there at the time, made it the place to go. But not this professor, says John Kenneth Galbraith, who had just married Kitty Galbraith only a few years before. I was um, much too virtuous to go to the old Howard. And as far as I recall, that was the only reason people ever went to Scully Square. Was there anything else? In the 40s, if Scully Square was known for burlesque, the South End was known for jazz. Places like Wally's, the hi-hat, the wigwam served up the music. 
couples and singles. And yeah, 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 after you get through work, get dressed and come down with your lady or and, and sit in the club, you know, and listen to the music. You know? Everybody dressed up. Oh, ladies was in their furs and heels. Everybody. Yeah, he's sharp dude. Hi. Yeah. Oh, you had to be dabbed when you came out, you know? Everything was popping, you know? Well, Everybody. it was so popular yeah. until uh, the musicians. Right. And you could not go on a job unless you had a necktie on. In That's fact, right. the standard uniform was a blue suit, a white shirt, right. and a necktie. It wasn't like today. You couldn't play a job unless you was dressed that way. Most of the club had a sign of dress code, yeah. but you didn't have that. They didn't need that because everybody came uh, dressed They were out yeah. for an evening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, That's right. That's what it had been. All of these places, with the exception of Wallace and the Savoy, had black Oh, uh, how you say, um, entertainers, but you were not welcome in there. Oh, yes. Ray Barron booked the jazz concerts at the Hi-Hat from 1947 to 1949. You could feel the bigotry in the city. Well, some people say they, everyone knows their place. You would never see someone colored going into the Metropolitan Theater. The RKO. These people never had an opportunity, even if they had the income, because they knew it was off limits. It was segregated. Uh, we didn't run into it maybe as much, but it was segregated. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, no. you're talking about the 40s now. We know what the 40s yeah. was. Mm. Uh, even if he associated with a few of them, there was places that you just didn't want to go. Has changed and the people has changed. Well, it's for the better or for the worse. But. We don't know. <laughs> the clubs have changed too. 97 year old Wally Wolcott is the last of the jazz club owners in Boston's South End. As for Scully Square and the old Howard, well, the end of the war meant the end of an era. With no more sailors docking in Boston's Barbary Coast. The footlights slowly but surely went dark. I'm still in love with the old Howard. <laughs> yeah, but... But there's no old Howard anymore. Yeah. On June 20, 1961, after several years of trying to preserve the old Howard, it was destroyed by fire. Frank Hatch's father, Francis, Harvard class of 1919, led the crusade to save the old Howard. When the theater uh, was burned, he was obviously upset, extremely disappointed, uh, but instead of, uh, of just sulking, he went home and wrote a song uh, and, and the lyrics. And I will now uh, give you the lyrics, which go like this. Boston has two Athenaeums both on Beacon Hill. One is for scholars with books by the score. The other for lads who seek life in the raw. The Boston Athenaeum's lights are bright, but the Howard Athenaeum's closed up tight. Then the chorus went like this. Some coward closed the old Howard. They're hanging crepe on Scully Square. World tension makes the suspension almost more than we can bear. What's become of Flo Laverne and Peachy De La Rose? Brooding with the unemployed, wearing all their clothes. Some dastard went ahead and plastered a sheriff's notice on the door. Some coward closed the old Howard. We don't have Burley anymore and we've lost Curly. We don't have Burley anymore. Some closed the old Howard. We, we don't, don't have Burley anymore.